Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. My name is Teresa Vizi. I'm the interim director of the Ulrich Museum of Art here at Wichita State. It's a special time here at WSU as this fall we celebrate the centennial of the birth of Gordon Parks, a Kansas native who was simultaneously a photographer, a filmmaker, a composer, an author, uh, truly a man with many gifts and many talents. For our second Buzzworthy Art Talk held in conjunction with the Park Centennial, we've invited acclaimed artist Hank Willis Thomas uh, here to speak tonight. We asked Hank to talk about his shared legacy with Gordon Parks, both cultural and artistic. If the name Willis sounds familiar to some of you, uh, it is, as our first Buzzworthy Art Talk was Hank's mother, Dr. Deborah Willis, who is chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of Arts at New York University. The adage is true, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Uh, the intelligence and the artistic talents that we saw in Dr. Willis are the same characteristics found in her extraordinarily talented son. At her talk in October, Dr. Willis assured us that she made her son, Hank, become an artist, uh, perhaps kicking and, and screaming just a little. Uh, but I have a feeling that it wasn't really maternal pressure that determined his artistic pursuits as much as it was his drive and desire to truly create dynamic works of art. We first saw uh, Hank's work in fall 2007 with the Ulrich exhibition Branded and on Display, which examined the work, the recent work of contemporary artists who are engaged in the strategies of branding and merchandising. Featured in the Ulrich newsletter and on the cover of our exhibition invitation was uh, Hank's 2003 photograph, Branded Head, which depicts the side of a black man's head with the Nike swoosh logo um, branded in there. Several months ago, the Ulrich Museum added to its collection a set of Hank's paintings called I Am a Man, which are currently on view in the Baring Gallery over at the Ulrich Museum in the exhibition, Who Are We? Artists Explore Identity. The paintings are inspired by a 1968 photograph of a strike by black sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee protesting meager compensation, poor working conditions, and racist behavior from their white supervisors, these sanitation workers marched and carried placards that demanded human decency by simply stating, I am a man. Willis, inspired by this statement and the photograph, I am a man, developed variations of it in his paintings, which you can see over in the Baron Gallery, including I am, I am, uh, be a man, and you the man. Hank lives in Manhattan, but his work keeps him busy and traveling. He has exhibited nationally at venues such as the Smithsonian Institution, the Birmingham Museum of Art in Birmingham, Alabama, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, and the Orange County Museum of Art in Newport Beach, California. He is represented by Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York and currently has an exhibition there, his third solo exhibition with the gallery, entitled What Goes Without Saying, which includes photographs, sculpture, paintings, and new media. Uh, known for his innovative use of advertising, which is now a global language, uh, Hank builds complex narratives about history, identity, and race. His work is featured in several public collections, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the International Center of Photography in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art. He received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and his Master's in Photography along with a Master's in Visual Criticism from California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And guess whose work is on this month's cover the 110, 110th anniversary edition of Art News Magazine, but Hank Willis Thomas. We truly have an art world star in our midst. Please help me welcome to Wichita, Hank Willis Thomas. So I, I, I'm starting a new tradition. Uh, when I give a lecture, I like, because sometimes I run into people again and I don't remember who it is, so I, I like to take a picture <laughs> of everybody. So I hope it's okay that I stand on the furniture. <laughs> uh, 
so okay, if you guys can just scoot over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, yeah, I hope you guys careful. have good insurance. All right, you guys ready? Can I get yeah. some energy? Yeah. Ready? One, two, three. I wish that wasn't. What, what's bad? There was a new thing after cheese that's maybe better. What is it? Pizza. Pizza. Does that get some energy? <laughs> anyway, so um, I actually have a, a habit of right before I give a talk, changing everything I was going to say so I can uh, confuse myself. So what you guys saw me come in and kind of rearrange a bunch of stuff. Um, because I think every time I go somewhere, I, I, you know, if you do a lot of talks, and my talks are frequently very personal, but you don't, you want to, you want to remember that it's real life. Because I could literally give a talk in my sleep about my work, because it's basically just talking about myself and stuff that I've done. Um, and, but I really think it's important to try something new. So again, I've tried something new, and um, so I don't want to say bear with me because I'm sure it'll be interesting. <laughs> um, but this is. Uh, kind of an off the uh, kind of a random way to start, but I actually went to Vietnam in 2010, and it was a really profound experience for me because I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned about about uh, the world, about um, that country, but also about this country. And one of the things I think that was most profound was being in this shop in a small town called Hoi An. Um, where they were selling, you know, all of these Buddha statues, and you walk. I walked in, and there was the, the Buddha was holding a Mastercard welcome sign. <laughs> and to think about this war that was um, fought, you know, 40 years ago, where over three million people lost their lives um, because of our, our our beef with communism, and then to come into the country, as uh, my father was in that war. Um, and imagine walking these same streets, but then seeing kind of how we now see, in a way, they won, but then we won. And this way in which actually religion and communism and spiritualism and, and commercialism are, is, is mixed in. It really kind of speaks to a lot more of the complexities that kind of I'm really interested in looking at with uh, history and culture. Um, it's so funny, I really have no idea what I want to say next. <laughs> um, but often when I, 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 I got it, <laughs> do I? Often when I um, give talks about my work, I start off with this quote by Carl Hancock Rux, and the quote is from a book called Everything But the Burden, and he says, there's something called black in America, and there's something called white in America, and I know them when I see them, but I will forever be unable to explain the meaning of them, because they're not real, even though they have a very real place in my daily way of seeing a fundamental relationship to my ever-evolving understanding of history, and a critical place in my relationship to humanity. Uh, this quote really means a lot to me because I think it speaks to so many, so many of the complexities of the challenges that I've faced as uh, a, an artist, as an African-American man, as a person who is, who, um, as a human being, and because as I travel outside of the country and recognize the, all the values and all the things we debate and argue about in our history is, not necessarily as important when you're in, you know, Cambodia or South Africa, um, or even in France, and, and recognizing how um, our relationships to race, to blackness, to whiteness, which are so fixed here, really shift a lot as you move around. Uh, but even in the context of here, I think we see complex um, and controversial relationships to, to, to race and culture. And looking at these two different ads, I'm really just kind of fascinated kind of how they were for American Apparel, how they kind of came in to the visual lexicon. And one of the inspirations for this image specifically was, I, I, was this. And, and how many people here know who this is? Anybody? So this is a picture of Burt Williams. And Burt Williams was one of the first um, African-American celebrities um, of the 20th century, and what I find so fascinating is how he chose to represent himself in the real world, and how he performed and was celebrated for his performance of blackness on stage, and, and really found it interesting how um, a quote unquote black man was being paid to perform authentic blackness by actually putting on a mask, and this speaks to kind of the irony of these kind of ideas of, of a, of a, of a kind of authentic, you know, other. And I also think about the status quo. 
Um, and because most of my life, how, wait, yeah, most of my life, this was the status quo. There was this thing called the Great White Hope, you know, who, and uh, basically in boxing, you know, African Americans had dominated that sport for most of the 20th century, African American men, and then, and white men <laughs> dominated basically everything else. <laughs> and in the past five years, we've seen kind of an amazing flipping of the script that kind of speaks to a really amazing kind of change of how now that's, you know, the Klitschko brothers, these Eastern European brothers have kind of dominated heavyweight boxing, but all of a sudden nobody ever cares about heavyweight boxing anymore. Um, but then we, as we've seen, you know, there's some, another undefeated multi-ethnic um, person, you know, in the White House. And I think that's really interesting uh, when you think about how history changes. And I think it's really about perspective. And when I think about um, Gordon Parks, almost, I mean, literally fearlessly going into every environment and flipping the script. Um, I don't really see much of a connection between myself and him other than like, I was in awe and I loved the Shaft theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I mean, because I mean, having met him several times since I was a child and, and, um, and older, um, it's just like you just, and, and seeing, you know, 20 year old women, you know, fawn over a 90 year old man, <laughs> you know, there's something that was so magical about his whole thing that I, I can't even imagine just like tr saying, I'm going to make a film and then another film while I'm writing a book and I'm going to make score music and I'm going to do a, uh, you know, I'm choreograph a dance and I'm going to photograph and, you know, and travel the world and like with, so I mean the real lesson I learned from him is probably through um, my parents, you know, um, who like many people of their generation um, recognized that um, opportunities weren't going to come to them, that they were going to have to go to the opportunities. Um, and I think as when we talk about my mom inspiring me to be an artist, um, it, I, I actually did, never really wanted to be an artist. I, I um, yeah, never, uh, until I was 28, I was out of graduate school. I was like, okay, I really have spent 10 years or 14 years in art school. I guess I might as well <laughs> try it. <laughs> but up until then, I, I was really just trying to figure out the world. And because I really always struggled with notions of the truth. And, uh, and, and what I'm doing differently is I'm gonna start off with a project that I usually often don't talk, it's a more contemporary, more recent project. I'm gonna show you a trailer to a contemporary collaborative project that, I, that I've done called Question Bridge Black Males and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Is, can we turn this down, the, the light on me down a little bit? Or is that, no? Okay. Black man. Do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance for taking responsibility for improving our communities? Are your children better or worse off as a result of your involvement? Why wouldn't you be happy with your son being gay? Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is why? I believe that we've incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker. Along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. When I came up, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. Sometimes I think because we think we're black, we, we're some other kind of human beings, but we're just like most other human beings. Why didn't y'all leave us the blueprint? We did leave you a blueprint. We just didn't tell you where it was. That's something that we dropped the ball on. What do you fear? That something will harm my children. I fear success. Am I the only one who has problem eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> God, I don't know, bro. Y'all niggas crazy. That word, we have to stop using it. I think black people can say nigga anytime they want. How dare you? What, what right do you have to use this word? A lot of nigga questions for the rapper. What is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? Hmm. This is the easiest question in the world to answer. The thing that we have in common is that we are male and we are black. All right, my question is, 
I try to live good, but I'm surrounded by bad. And I want to know what it is I could do to do better and live peaceful, surrounded by all evil. How can, how can I do that? So, so that project is called Question Bridge Black Males, and it's a collaborative project that was inspired um, by an earlier project by one of my professors, who's one of my collaborators. And it was, it's a five-channel video installation um, currently that uh, was uh, on display at the Brooklyn Museum, the Oakland Museum, the Utah MOCA, Sundance Film Festival, among other places in this year. Um, and what it really is is a, it's a video-mediated megalogue, what we're calling it, between African-American men about whatever <laughs> issues came up for them. So we, uh, f four of us traveled around the country and asked African-American men to ask questions of any other African-American men. And then we tried to find people to answer that question and wound up having uh, about 162 participants and about 1,600 question and answer exchanges. And the real idea of the project is even as an African-American male myself, I sometimes struggle with, well, everyone I think struggles with representations of kind of the who they are supposed to be. Uh, but I think no one in America is more challenged or limited by the, ge the general perception of who they are than African-American men because so many of the stereotypes are so negative and so limiting. And so I wanted to show, or we wanted to show, that there is as much range within any demographic as there is outside of it. These are people watching the installation at the Brooklyn Museum. And it's really fascinating because, you know, even in that trailer, you see, I think, maybe 15 different men. And uh, the idea is that, you know, you, everyone is an individual. That, you know, not that you can't just say that all black men are this or all black men are that. And that was our hypothesis going out into the world and then actually going out and doing this, these, these, these video interactions with these men, we actually realized how complex the truth is. We thought we, we'd do a documentary, we'd get one, because all the questions and answers came from the subject. So uh, we'd literally say, do you have a question? We'd videotape them asking a question, and then we'd go somewhere else to find someone answering. And we thought we'd just take the best answer, best question and best answer and like fuse it together. But we wound up having five and six kind of great answers to each question, which really complicated the notion of the truth and the reality about it. And I think one of the things I'm really trying to, to address or wanted to start off talking about is this notion of the truth. And this is because I think photography f often is believed to be a, a representation of the truth. And what I learned through um, my, much of my mother's work is that the truth is, we know the truth is subjective, but even in photography, there's always things going on outside of the frame of the camera that can really affect how we understand the truth. Um, and speaking to that, another current project of mine, which is also collaborative, and a lot of artists don't work collaboratively, but when I was speaking, speaking to some students today, I was talking about my collaborative projects, and I usually don't get to them, so I figure I'll start off with them. Um, and this is called The Truth Booth. Um, and The Truth Booth is another project where we're really trying to figure out how to get everyday people to become a part of the art making process and populate the content of the project. So this is a project that we did in Ireland with a different artists uh, last year where we created this big inflatable speech bubble and we had people go in and touch screen and it says everyone has their version of the truth, what's yours? And so we traveled around Ireland and uh, asked people to kind of interact with it. And in, in a way, because a lot of my other work can be so heavy and so serious, it's really great to do projects that actually bring a different element or different energy to it. And so this is, um, and so I wanted to show you guys a few different clips just from the truth booth. The truth is not to be discovered because it was there before we were born. It hid itself when we were born and it only comes out again once we are dead. I'm nearly dead, so the truth will shortly emerge. Truth is I love animals. I believe that the truth is the struggle to find what it really is. The truth is really small. It's very hard to see. But if you look really, really close, you will find the truth. And it's all around. Thank you. The truth is, I 
still don't actually know how I've ended up in Northern Ireland. I mean, I live in Belfast and I've lived there now for about three and a half years. And I think it's all means to an end, but the truth is I still don't know why. I also think the truth is, on a bigger level, that kind of really intense gut feeling that you feel inside your stomach when you're trying to make a decision. Whether it's pure instinct and happy emotion, or it's a really hollow, aching feeling, the truth is, whatever that feeling is right inside, in between your breastbones, that is, um, that is what the truth really is. The truth is that I'm really scared of moving away and I'm missing my family and my boyfriend Mike very much. But I know that the real truth is that it's all that it's going to work out because I'm a positive person. It is true that I've got a girlfriend that is named Rian. And it is true that my favorite animal is a dolphin, okay? And that's all I wanted to say. The truth is, Molly, you're a bitch. The truth is that I want to be an actor, a dancer, a singer, but I'm not sure how to get into the business. I've joined Trading Faces and well, I've joined the agency of Zare, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get into the... Well, I am in the agency, I'm not sure if I'm going to get anything out of it. And I just really want to be an actress especially, or maybe a beautician, or a singer maybe, or maybe a dancer, but I'm not sure how to get in. That's the truth. <laughs> this was an accident keen production. I want to say hello to Melody, because she's my little doggy and all my other pets, and my parents. Peace out. The truth, I believe, is Lego. Lego brings you think small, but believe big. Lego is in all our minds. So the truth is very, very small, but think big. It's very cute. Thank you. I, I just love that idea of like a 10 year old saying, the truth is Legos, you know. <laughs> You know, I mean, I think that's like pretty amazing. What, so we're really what this project is about for me is just about actually, and you know, having an opportunity, both of those projects, about having opportunities to be a voyeur. And this was one of the, because we realized, you know, strangers, you, it's, this is really about people being generous and sharing uh, parts of their reality. And I want to show you two more. I think he says. You are suffocating. The man of my dreams. He was suffocating, and I didn't tell anyone. This guy, he, he locked his father in a, in a shed, and <laughs> that was his truth. The only truth is love. That's the only truth. I just got married to the man of my dreams, and I'm in love. The truth is unspeakable pain after 25 years of love and devotion and vows. The truth is in this world there are very few people who love you. A lot of people who tell you they love you only love themselves and other people. The truth is you should be told how to rely on yourself. The truth is, people should tell you not to let anybody else in. The truth is, your family should tell you not to let anybody else in, even your family. Because sooner or later, are you going to be betrayed? That's the truth as far as I know it now. This would not have been the truth as I knew it two weeks ago when I thought I would help because the phone was downloaded and I'd bring it 
upstairs because he always wanted the phone by the bed, whether he was in a different room because he slept better or not. And I saw the message. And I texted. And she texted back. And that is their truth. And it was their truth for a very long time. And I asked him, and he denied the truth. But eventually. The truth is, it's all about being happy and making sure that everything you do is aimed at keeping you happy. But I suppose it's also the truth that you won't always be happy because you have to do things in life that you don't like, um, that make you sad. But ultimately, you go through all the sadness and the pain and the hard times. And at the end of it, you're a better person, you're stronger. And so you can deal with things better. And I suppose ultimately, the hard times and going through them and all that will maybe make you a happier person. And I think the truth is you need to know yourself, but to a point. I think, I think actually if you know yourself too well, it can get a bit depressing because I think sometimes you're, you're not as great as you think you are. But if you don't know that, you have this kind of pretend image of yourself that, you know, it's an image you have and that's you. But to the world, they see something different. But for you, you have this lovely image of, you know, you as a kind of either a great person, you're way better than anyone else, you're fabulous and beautiful. Or sometimes that image for you is that you're fat, you're ugly, and you're not confident, no one likes you. But I think if you pretend, or if you try and imagine yourself as something you like, and kind of use that, you become confident and you can enjoy life. The truth is, this is the truth. Not corrupted. Baby, beautiful, this is the truth. So anyway, I could look at these all day. <laughs> um, but it's just so fascinating to see like that, I mean, like people come in and they just, because we're not, we're not there when they're recording, so you never have no idea what they're going to say. And similar to Question Bridge, where these are total strangers in different parts of the world, uh, the country having a conversation. And so it, it kind of provides a certain space for an openness that you often don't have when you're in the same room with people. And I think it's just um, so beautiful and scary. And thank you guys for taking the time to look at it, but you are sitting down already. <laughs> and so, um, but actually more recently, we were able to actually bring the Truth Booth to the second debate, uh, presidential debate in, uh, at Hofstra University, and that was really fascinating as well. And um, I, don't, I don't know, I could, say, I could go on, but uh, I won't. Um, and so, back to me. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, my mother has been my primary interest um, in kind of my career, starting my career as an artist and photographer, and her main inspiration as, as a young person, actually, um, was this book by Roy de Carava and, and Langston Hughes called The Sweet Fly Paper Life, where it was the photographs of Roy de Carava and the text of Langston Hughes, and they basically collaborated to um, speak about um, the, the beauty and the complexity and the challenges uh, the, of African-American experience um, in the 50s. And for my mother, as a, as a young woman, young girl, that was the first time uh, when she saw this book in the Philadelphia Public Library that she says she saw pictures of African-Americans as she saw them, as real and, and, and complicated in, in people, um, whereas most of the images she saw on television were these caricatures or, or, or these images mostly of, of people being abused. And I, I think she, that's when she really understood the power of photographs. And so I grew up with both of my parents, but uh, with my mother um, primarily as um, the influence. And um, this is, so this is us a long time ago. And I sometimes, like she has a, maybe many historians do this, but she doesn't throw away much. 
<laughs> and sometimes I kind of force stuff to be thrown away. And I, but I always go through it because I know some of it might be important. And I was looking through it and I found this um, research paper that she'd written while she was an undergrad. Um, and it said, um, and I, because you know, she basically, as a young African American woman studying photography, there were very many precedents that she was aware of. And so when she'd ask her professors who were teaching photo history to tell her about the African Americans, et cetera, they actually they could only really speak about Gordon Parks and Roy de Carava and knew a little bit about Langston, um, I mean, James Van Der Zee. Um, and so one of her professors said, why don't you make that your, your, your project? <laughs> so basically, do your, why don't you do my work for me? <laughs> um, and so she, this was her research paper. She said, I found no standard history, art history that refers to African American artists. References led to more references, which are scanty. And I've written 50 letters to possible resources and have enthusiastic resource uh, re feedback by receiving letters extending invitations to visit the special collections and libraries. The ph photographers I plan to concentrate on, my research on, are the following. And you can see um, 10 photographers. And you see Gordon Parks, born 1912 in um, Kansas and, and among, among others. And I know that uh, Mr. Parks was the f one of the first people that actually responded to her as a student. And they basically kept a relationship from then for the next 30, almost 35 years. And, what our, and so my mom, had, w this book, um, this research project turned into her first book, which was called Black Photographers, 1840 to 1940, a biobibliography. And for many people, this book was for any, this book was revolutionary in general because not no one really knew and understood the importance and what it meant that African Americans, as early as 1839, when photography was invented, were actually in the process of making photographs. Like before slavery um, had had been abolished in the United States, there not not everyone was in bondage, and uh, and and not, and it speaks a contrast almost all of the kind of stereotypes of what black people could deal with and do intellectually because how, like none of us in this room can make a photograph from scratch, you know, and think about someone with, uh, where in a, in, in a country where it's illegal for you to learn how to read to actually figure out how to, to create, you know, learn chemistry and create a, a you know, build a, a camera, especially in the 1840s and, and, and print, print that printing process. And so, and really a lot of the images that African Americans were taking of other African Americans were very much in contrast to the images that mainstream society was taking. And that's really where I began to realize that history is, as Public Enemy said, you know, real history isn't history, it's his story. So whoever is telling the story has the power to control the narrative. And so whoever's holding the frame, you know, is the, is, is the story maker. And I think that's what we learned through looking at, you know, the work of Gordon Parks, where um, he's, turning, he's turning the camera and what he chose to frame with the frame on changed so many of the subjects of his photographs' lives because of um, where he cho chose and how he chose to photograph. Um, and my, my, I think, so kind of growing up in that environment and you know, looking a lot like my mom, I, 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 we sometimes, um, I, I've been places and people who've never met me before come up like, you're Deb Willis's son, aren't you? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And you know, more recently, she told me that it used to be that I was Deb's son, and now she's Hank's mom, <laughs> because. Uh, and so this, we did a, a piece. We we did a show together a few years ago called Progeny, and it's called. And this is a piece from it called Sometimes I See Myself in You. You know, it's about this kind of symbiotic relationship that we have, where a lot of my work is kind of following in the footsteps of hers. And I like to point out that I graduated from NYU in 1998, and. They hired her in 2001, and she's now the chair of the department. So I like to say that I paved the way for her. <laughs> um, but um, and, but my, uh, another major influence of my work is my cousin Sangha, who I also grew up under. And um, this diptych that I took kind of described our relationship right after I graduated school, um, where you know I was up at two o'clock in the morning taking pictures of myself in the ceiling, and he was so cool that he'd fall asleep with his sunglasses on. Um, and um, I'm going to actually, I was going to, I don't know why this, I usually talk, okay, I'll say. So my book, <laughs> which was published by Aperture in 2008, the title of the book is called Pitch Blackness. And I say pitch blackness because my cousin, who I just showed you the image of, was murdered. And there was this feeling of loss that I had after he was murdered, like, who am I when I'm, I don't have someone to follow, in a sense. And then uh, pitch blackness, because advertising, which is a theme in a lot of my work, blackness 
is often pitched as a way to cash in on certain generalizations about um, you know certain people in our in our community. And lastly, um, I say off uh, um, off whiteness, pitch blackness. Coffee is the color of my skin, because I realized I'd actually never met. I've been all around the world, and I've never really met an actually black person, and I actually never met a white person. <laughs> you know, and um, ironically that. Uh, and we speak to things in this country, especially so much in this binary of black and white, where the majority of the people in the world are not black or white, they're Asian, who actually often have to be lighter than white people. <laughs> um, and it really speaks to this irony of like why we speak things in binary when like perhaps all of us are more close in skin tone to the colors of, you know, shade and the kinds of coffee we drink than it is about the color of our, our skin. And maybe this kind of will break away this binary because of the way that we speak about color in our language. Um, and then, uh, but I, since I speak, when I'm speaking to students, I often like to go back, back, back. And since I took so long in the beginning, I want to skip a lot through it, but you'll see a, a, a thread. This is one of the second roll of film I ever took. Um, and it was at the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington. And I, when I took it, I was really loving how there was this group of people kind of, A, I'd never seen people like getting wet just in public, <laughs> just like there was a sprinkler there, but this man was standing in there in this almost Christ-like pose, and all of these people were like kind of coming into the sprinkler, and I loved how the sprinkler became a frame. And I was really interested in like, I love the woman on the left with her hand, she's so far away from it, but her hand is out, you know, so there's this anticipation. Um, and when I, and so I, I think a lot, of, when I look back at a lot of my early photographs, frames within the frame were very kind of important. I was really always interested in kind of duality and kind of how I could reference what's going on outside of the frame or, or different kind of perspectives. And so that, I, that was like a really interesting theme for me because I realized because of the images I'd kind of, I, you know, I, most people don't grow up with images of complete strangers in their house, you know, and, and so I'd see these pictures and, you know, my mom and, you know, on, I mean on her walls of all these different people that she was doing work about and, and learned about. And that really kind of put, gave me a different relationship to photography. And so my sophomore year in college, I started to actually take the frame um, more literally and started to actually try to work with my peers at school to actually make interesting things outside of the frame, but also make things happening within the frame. So it was this real kind of attempt to really critique or complicate the relationship, my relationship to the frame. Um, but then I realized that I wasn't going to be able to actually get the technical um, level of quality that I wanted because of the limitations I had. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to actually, I did, chose to just take the frames out into the real world. And I'd go out and give people, in a sense this was my first collaboration, where I'd give people a frame and ask them to take a picture and then I'd take a picture of them taking pictures. And it became this kind of dance of me trying to figure out where they were trying to position, what they were trying to photograph, and us kind of sharing this photographic moment and experience together. Um, and you see things like this one where there's, and this one you can see the World Trade Center in the background, so it's dated by that, but there's almost like three, three photographs. There's what's going on between the two people who are holding the frame, there's what's going on in that frame, and then there's the people on the left like kind of like looking like, what is this dude doing? <laughs> um, but then, so there's always, so, so for me it was really just kind of this exercise of not, of, of whenever I'd go to the f take a picture, I wanted to kind of be reminded that I am creating a reality, you know, and, and, and I'm choosing to select what I choose to select as important and valuable. Um, and some of them kind of had these kind of tricks of the eye. And um, this is this, the, the, the exact, you know, moment that you would never take a photograph, you know, the, there's the Kodak moment and this is like the, the opposite where like one person's about to sneeze and the other person's wiping his nose. <laughs> Um, but this one actually really um, spoke to um, the real challenge, that, uh, the real thing I was really trying to get to, which was um, how, how much chance falls into play in any photograph, where in order for this picture to work, you know, as it works, is A, I had to have color film, <laughs> but I had to kind of, my mother was living in DC, she came up to New York, I had to like wake up, which was hard, <laughs> and for breakfast and like, Bring the bring a frame and my big old camera, and then my mom had to be wearing her red hat, and then and in the thirtieth of a second that I happened to be taking a picture, someone had to be walking down a busy street in New York City and like look into a dark restaurant 
into a frame while someone was taking a picture, you know? And like, then there's the red ketchup and the red cup. Like, and so I call this serendipity in red, but it's like, these are like so many different kind of collisions, so many different points that happen right in front of the camera. And like, you can't really derive any real meaning from that as much as, and that's where I talk about, it's like a split second of time, a narrow point of view and two dimensional space with no sound, no aural and, um, and so, so that's where I'm really, I've always been challenged uh, with photographs. And I think this is where I, I maybe meant to put that other image. Um, and so this picture of my cousin was um, right after I graduated college, maybe a year or so afterwards. And I stopped really taking photographs. I was working as a photographer's assistant and a production assistant. And this is a picture of him that one of the few pictures I took. And I just thought he just looked so peaceful and I loved the like, really muted colors, how it was almost black and white and he looked so beautiful to me. And it wound up being the last picture I took of him alive. And this uh, wound up being the first picture of mine that was ever printed in a newspaper. And the photograph um, was um, basically you know, published in the Philadelphia New um, Daily News and I realized again, like the, how I was being manipulated, not just through the photograph, but this time through the text, because we always think of the news as objective until we actually, we know it's not, but until it's about us and then you really recognize, you know, it says a good, good guy slain for a few bucks. And already, you know, you wonder why they had to choose those words, you know, with his image. And then, uh, and it's also, there's a suggestion that maybe if he was a bad guy, and it was a lot of bucks. Maybe it wouldn't have been news, you know. Killers shot him even though he didn't resist. You know, so there's like these things that are like saying that if you fight for your life, maybe, you know, you had it coming. I don't, I don't know. And, and reading kind of the, the article kind of like talks about all these things about how he was a good kid and he came from this kind of family and blah, blah, blah. And I realized how I, even though it was something that was really personal to me, it was as personal as it gets, how I was being manipulated to care in a way that I wondered if it, you know, it, it seemed like putting value over a certain kind of lives instead of others, um, and justifying why this, you know, young, because we know young black men are killed literally daily in the dozens um, in our country, and so why should we care? Um, uh, and, and so I, I was really struck by that. And as a photographer at his funeral, I felt I needed to document it. But in a sense, this wound up being the moment I stopped being a photographer because I realized that no, photograph was going to bring my cousin back was going to change that reality for me and that um, I felt, you know, it felt totally pointless. And I happened to have just been in the process of applying to graduate school then. And when I got to graduate school and I did get in, in California College of the Arts in San Francisco, I like had all these pictures of my cousins and I didn't really know what to do because I literally had no plan. And I um, wound up uh, going back to you know, where my cousin was murdered and trying to photograph that. Um, but of course, he wasn't there. There was nothing there, per se. And I'd look at the pictures of the funeral again and kind of photograph other friends and family members who were affected or kind of in this process of mourning. And in a way, I think they're decent images, but I didn't, couldn't really find a point to them in a way. I felt like I was photographing an event where the drama, so to speak, had already happened. And I didn't know how to, it felt really self-indulgent, like, okay, please, I'm taking pictures for you to care about how I'm, the pain that I feel, which I guess is okay, but at the same time, it wasn't really getting, translating to um, the greater issues that I felt like I was trying to address. And this is his mother, and she um, gave me, you know, everyone, I was, you know, because him and I were so close and we lived together for so much, we were like brothers, um, er everyone was concerned for me and emotionally and things like that. And, uh, one of the things that his mother did is she gave me this uh, post-it and an envelope and it said, the pics is difficult to look at. Take a deep breath and say a prayer before looking at Sangha. Be encouraged, which is you know, already a strange thing to get in a note. Um, and then the image was this image, which I really wasn't sure I wanted to show today, but I realized um, how important it is to talk about um, a different reality, a different part of life, a different part of our experience. Um, and and uh, my experience, because this, I had seen him, of course, in the, mo in, in the funeral home, but this image kind of struck me on a lot of levels from the kind of gawker perspective of looking at where the bullet entered his head 
um, to looking at how he looks so peaceful and, you know, um, and handsome even. Um, but then I was really struck by the fact that there was, basically when she went to identify the body, this was what's on the screen. And, to, and there's, uh, he wasn't Sunga Willis, you know, this wonderful person I knew, he was just this number, 000602, which I can only imagine is the number of bodies that had come into the, the, the morgue by that time. And I realized at the time we couldn't afford, like a, we could barely afford a funeral, much less a tombstone and you know, all these other things that are required when you have a funeral. Um, and I realized that um, at the, then at the same time, my mom was diagnosed with, uh, a year, no, no, a year later, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And as you know, she survived. My grandmother um, um, was diagnosed with cancer and she's now 92, so she also survived. But at the time, I felt like I was gonna be losing so many people that were really important to me in a short period of time. But I also had these relationships with people who were friends of my cousin that we were really just connected through this loss. And I was kind of the, the conduit to all of these people who were in this mourning process who either never knew each other or never had a personal connection or, or didn't even know each other existed. So I started this project called Bearing Witness, Murder's Wake, where I tried to photograph as many people as I could who were affected by my cousin's life or death as a way to actually kind of spend time with him through the people who bear witness to, to his existence. Because I realized if you're not rich or you're not famous, which by global standards most people in this room are, um, that you know, the only proof of your real existence are the people who, 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 who could attest to that. Um, because most people don't have a, you know, a, a tombstone. Most people don't have a marked grave. Or, uh, and so this project was kind of aimed, again, you could talk about it as a collaboration, but it was a futile attempt to take a portrait of my cousin through, through these people who, and the missing spaces as the installation grew were the people who I'd never know or I'd never photograph you know, as, as I kind of assembled this project. Um, and of course, each you know some of them have already passed on, so they become um, the memory kind of becomes more disparate. Um, and so at the same time, and this is kind of a heavy project, you know. Um, hey, you guys want? I only have a relationship to you because my cousin was murdered. Do you guys want to spend some time together so I can photograph you? <laughs> it's like and, you know I did that for almost nine years, and kind of interest in going through that process of becoming more and more uh, detached from it at a certain level, but. My cousin was killed in, in a robbery um, outside of a club in Philadelphia. And when we were younger, a lot of people would kind of talk about how, you know, um, people were getting killed over like Air Jordan sneakers and Jansport backpacks and triple fat goose coats. And um, my cousin was an athlete and he kind of wore the Air Jordans and it was kind of a source of pride that nothing had ever, ever happened. Um, but I, I was reading his book called Michael Jordan and the New Trans Global Economy and it said, um, there's a quote by Stanley Crouch where he says, in 1960, if white girls in the suburbs had posters of a Negro that dark on their wall, there would have been hell to pay. That kind of racial paranoia is not true in the country now. Today you have girls who are Michael Jordan fanatics and their parents don't care. And which I thought was fascinating that in the like, short, like 25, first 25 years of his life, growing up in the segregated South to becoming this transracial, transnational icon, really just because he could put a ball through a hoop really good. It was pretty fascinating, and I, I wanted to think about how someone of his stature might have been treated at a different period of time. So I created this piece, um, Hang Time, circa 1923, thinking about the legacy of lynching and um, that, that quote. And, and I started thinking about logos as our generation's hieroglyphs and thinking about how I could actually use logos as a way to kind of speak to uh, other issues. And these are the works when I was talking to students before uh, about how I didn't have when I went to graduate school, there were no photo majors, so I wound up having to figure out what I could do to kind of make art that other people could talk about, and that really actually forced me to expand my relationship to, to things. And, and one of the things I felt like I did have a connection to, because through my relationship with photography was advertising and that language, and I started thinking about advertising as the most ubiquitous language in the world, because even if I don't speak the language, I can actually look at the ad and put it together, and I feel like I, in a way, it's um, underused for its ability to speak across languages because it's almost always about selling something but not translating ideas and communicating. So, and I could talk about each of these pieces, but um, I really want to try to get through um, a bunch of work. Um, and so, but I started thinking about how slaves were branded as a sign of ownership and how today 
so many of us, all of us, you know, live in a greater stage of a branded consciousness than anyone, any previous generation, where, you know, the cars we buy, the phone we use, the computer we use, you know, the cable network we choose, you know, all seem to say something about our, how we see ourselves and how we, the selves we want to project into the real world, the rest of the world. And I started thinking about, you know, how for so many um, African American men, the idea of ascending was chained through ascending through sports and entertainment. Um, when you have, and when you have the descendants of slaves kind of being uh, the, 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 f the fuel for this cotton economy in a different way. Um, and more recently, for, I started thinking about the society of the spectacle and thinking about um, how people who are in the NBA are f likely to be uh, descendants and relatives of people who were lynched. And so that kind of other relationship to the, to the hanging um, could be kind of spoken about through the, through the photography, to, through the art. And, but then I started thinking about how we could actually flip the script on our relationship to the noose, where rather than it being something that's a threat, we can make it something that we dominate. And so I shot a video where it's these guys playing basketball through a noose, you know, and that becomes the goal. Um, but then I was thinking about the um, sharecropping and um, the NCAA college sports, where it's, uh, you know, a multi billion dollar industry that's fueled off of the free labor, primarily of the descendants of slaves, where their ancestors likely actually, you know, worked those fields. And think and, and revisited uh, that, that other image, so this is football and chain, um, and really like trying to kind of comment on this kind of interesting kind of um, polarity. Um, or, and, and, but then I also made, kind of these credit cards. I, I collaborated with a friend to make uh, like the Chase MasterCard, because I actually had a Chase MasterCard. And, you know, and it's occurred to me at one point, like, well, who's the master? <laughs> you know, I started thinking about credit cards as a form of indentured servitude, and how, because increasingly in our society, you need a credit card to do anything, and even if you don't use the credit card, you have, you're charged. And so, um, and wondering how like, this kind of debt-based society is kind of changing our relationship to, to freedom. Um, but thinking about the, the door of no return, revisiting that in, in, in Gory Island, I made absolute no, absolute no return. But then reflecting on my cousin again, thinking about, um, and obviously these are all referencing that early master, I mean, absolute campaign, death being absolute. Um, and so uh, and I'm going to show you all another video project um, called Winter in America. It was a collaboration with another artist named Kambui Olajimi, who's a good friend. Um, and a little bit loud in the beginning. That was a good night, man. I'm glad I met you, brother. I ain't had fun like this in a long time. That's what I'm saying, though, right? You had crazy fun tonight, right? Grandma home. Man, listen, this spot here is the John on Tuesday nights. Yo, I seen you in what? 15 years? Yo, when you gonna stop bullshitting in New York, come back home, man. Philly. Y'all some wild boys. I'm saying. I'm saying, though, whenever y'all wanna come to New York, we can do this every night. To be honest, it does feel good to be near the family. Y'all feel me? It's cold out here. Y'all ready? Yeah, yeah. Oh! <laughs> yo, where you been hiding? I know that ain't Tyrose. Nah. Ty Tyrose would have told me if he was coming out tonight. That ain't the truth. What's the size of the room? Ooh, what's up, baby? <laughs> nah, nah, I was just kicking it with my ball from back in the day. I ain't seen him in like 200,000 years. I had to call him six times, uh-huh, just to get him to leave his grandmama house. Whatever, whatever. Hey, Teddy. Yo, what's up, bro? Yo, y'all know Teddy. Yo, and this is my man, Sunday. How y'all feeling? Yeah, yeah. Yo, what's up, what's up? Yo, it's nice to meet y'all, but I left my coat in the car, so I gotta run. It's so cold out here, I feel like I'm gonna turn into chocolate pudding pop in a minute. Yeah, I'm 
Shanna had a total package over there. Give me the lie. Yeah, she was fine, but did you see the job? Yo, hold on, hold on. Yo, is he doing snow angels? Hey, Osunga. Yo, what are you doing, man? A second ago, you freezing, Mr. Puddin' Pot. Now, you going around in the snow. You gonna fuck around to catch pneumonia. We ain't kids no more, man. Yo, that's a nice chain. But who the fuck are you? Wish I had a chain like that. Hey, man, yo, yo, we ain't even got nothing. Man, give it up. Hey, man, who are you, man? We all good people here, you know what I'm saying? Yo, are you really trying to rob us in front of all these people, man? Yo, I can't believe this shit, man. Shut the fuck up and give up your shit. We all about love and shit, man. Man, don't fuck with me. Just Don't move. Yo, give him your keys. Come on, man, chill, man, chill. This chain ain't even real, man. Stay down. It's shiny, man. Come on, bro. How you gonna do that to him, man? He just got that chain. <laughs> How you gonna do that? Man, just give up your fucking chain. Just fucked up, man. He was having a good ass night. Oh, let's go, let's go. Yo, come on, come on, come on. Let's get the fuck out of here. Oh, fuck. Birdo. Oh, man, I thought you was watching him. Where the fuck they go? Fuck it, let's get out of here, man. Let's get the fuck out of here. Yo, come on, man, come on. Yo, what I do with him? Yo, yo just leave him. Fuck it, man. Just bang him. Just bang him. Just, just do it. And now it's a winter. Winter in America. So uh, that project, as I said, was called Winter in America, and it, it's a collaboration between myself and another artist, Kambuya Lajimi, and basically it's the, uh, the story of the last five minutes of my cousin's life as was told to me by the guys he was with that night, using the G.I. Joe action figures I played with as a kid and uh, stop motion animation. And we chose stop motion animation because it's such like a goofy, kind of format um, and trying to figure out how do you tell a story that everyone's heard before a million times in a new way and thinking about I was back to, and I'm, I'm going to flip through these photographs which we separately made a, a published a book of photographs because we realized that the film kind of carries you through the story but photographs kind of leave it to the viewer to kind of bring their own meaning and relationship and history to the narrative um, but I was in a store in in California and I saw um, Roadblock who was the second black G.I. Joe, um, and this is, this is a roadblock. And it was, uh, and that meant something, third black G.I. Joe. That meant something to me when I was seven. <laughs> um, um, and I, it was on a box, and I mean, the box that said, you know, for children ages five and up. And he had a machine gun and a machete and a laser. And I remember I could barely even read when I was five years old, but I, I had license to kind of create scenarios based around killing. Um, and I thought that that was kind of really I ironic in a society that says it doesn't condone violence for you to be get, giving kids this kind of this kind of opportunity to create their relationship to the world. And, you know, Kambui pointed out that the only reason that it says for children ages five and up is because younger kids might choke on the little gun and it'd be a liability for the company. Um, and the guys who wound up killing my cousin were ages 16 to, to, to 19. And so they were barely out of childhood themselves and thinking about kind of how um, these ideas kind of play a role in our relationship to um, society and, and, and young people's understandings of how to, what to value and how to get what they want. Um, so, and you know, in, in child's play, the death is always insignificant. You can just always pick the toy back up. But in reality, obviously it's absolute. Um, and thinking about around the same time as I did that, I, I kind of revisited that picture I took at my cousin's funeral, and I used the language of a MasterCard priceless land campaign to talk about um, kind of this, how even in mourning we're being marketed to. You know, you go into the funeral home and there's the $7,000 casket and the $5,000 casket and the $2,000 casket, and there's this unspoken thing that, you know, 
you couldn't afford to love them enough if you buy the $2,000 box of wood that's going to be thrown in the dirt and never to see them again, be seen again. Or, you know, you, you really love them if you buy the $7,000 box of wood that's going to be thrown in the dirt and never to be seen again. And in our case, either way, it was going to go on a credit card. And it was just really impossible decision for me to watch my aunts and my, my mother make. Um, and, you know, I, didn't, I hadn't really been aware of all the pomp and circumstance of that. And um, I wound up, sh you know, having the opportunity to show both of those pieces at the Urban Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. And um, the museum was really afraid that they might get in trouble for putting you know, a logo on, you know, their meaning to putting this out. And, and it was the first time I actually had to defend my work and I, they wanted me to take the take off or alter the MasterCard logo, but I realized if I did that, it wouldn't really be that potent. And um, maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But so I, so I, and there was no real controversy until I brought it to Birmingham, Alabama. And this is a video and there was- Great. Proud to be the most watched local newscasts in Alabama. Fox 6 News, the most powerful name in local news. Fox 6 News reporter Melanie Posey takes a look at it. She joins us live from the museum tonight. Melanie? Well, Janet and Devin, here is the picture that we're talking about. You can see the MasterCard logo and you see the MasterCard slogan. So you think it's a MasterCard ad, right? wrong. What it is doing is creating a lot of dialogue and those here at the museum say that is exactly what it was designed to do. The picture hangs boldly on the back of the Birmingham Museum of Art, an African-American family grieving at a funeral. The caption, a spinoff of the MasterCard advertising campaign. Three-piece suit, $250. Gold chain, $400. Nine-millimeter pistol, $79. Bullet, 60 cent. Picking the perfect casket for your son, priceless. To the unknowing eye, it brings a strong response. Yeah, that's offensive to me too because it seems like it's stereotypical that no, that people are just tagging the black community of the things that we use, the things that we buy, the things that we flaunt. And, um, and I'm not black, but I would think that it would be offensive to black people. I think when someone walks off the street, they're wondering, is it an ad? If not, why is it up here? What is it? What's the point? Why is MasterCard have their name on it? The this is not an ad. It's contemporary art on display at the Birmingham Museum of Art. The artist, a young black man by the name of Hank Willis Thomas. The picture taken at his own cousin's funeral after he was killed during a robbery. He wanted to get at the grief his family was feeling and the frustration with this sort of cycle of, of violence that's sort of afflicting the country. I think he's using the term priceless here, not in a satiric way, but to suggest that life is the most priceless thing of all. Willis relies on artistic license to play off of the MasterCard logo, a key he uses knowing how much Americans connect with advertising. After learning what it's all about, Jennifer Swenson's response turned from offense to grief and eventually hope. I guess the artist had a choice. He could have picked up a gun and he could have sought revenge. And what this artist chose to do was to um, make a statement, even though it's offensive to some people, if it changed one person's thought process in life, then it would be worth it. Now, because of the response to this picture, the museum has put up this explanation. However, as you can see, it is rather small in comparison to the picture. Some people may miss it, so they plan to add a much larger placard later. Also, the curator says the reason this piece is outside is because it was too large to fit inside. The so, that just sums it all up, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, it just, uh, it's really kind of a fascinating experience because when you make work that's somewhat political, I guess in the back of your mind you're always hoping that you know, there's going to be some kind of controversy or some people talking about it, but then you realize what happens when that happens and when they put it into like a three-minute news clip, you know, and it's really a lot really revealing about kind of, uh, you know, who has the right to talk about what. You know, it's like, first of all, it's, you know, it's, it's offensive until you say it's art. So if, you know, if it's an ad, it's, it's, a, it's offensive as art. It's supposed to be provocative, but then, you know, it was made by a young black man, so it's not racist. And it was a picture taken at his own cousin's funeral, so it's not insensitive, you know. And then, you know, this woman says, like, this wonderful, you know, thing, like, I'm not black, but I can see how it could be offensive to black people. <laughs> you know, it's basically like calling a foul for the other team. You know, <laughs> and so who has the right to be offended by what? And then you know, of course, at the end where she says this, you know, artists had a choice. You could have either you know, 
killed somebody or made art. You know, I was like, I think I made the right decision. <laughs> you know, um, so I mean, the, and so and it's so really kind of fascinating experience. Uh, and then I wanted to talk to you about an, another project. Um, is it okay? Okay. Um, so th this so this is um, a project called um, Unbranded. Well, no, this is not my art actually. This is an ad. <laughs> what do you guys think this is an ad for? W what? Vitamin tennis shoes. Any Reebok? Is there, is there, are there any, what I find fascinating about this is, is a Reebok ad, actually, but um, there actually are no Reebok products in this ad, and it speaks to, like, to me it was really kind of amazing kind of moment, and I realized about where we are in our consumption of media, where we can actually have three letters, RBK, and a symbol, and a person, and all of a sudden we can bring you know, all of this other meaning to it. Like, it's selling shoes, clearly, because it's Reebok. But really, you know, it's 50 Cent who, and he, uh, s you know, says, I am what I am. And I guess, you know, so he is, you know, perhaps this. And uh, actually, the only logo in this ad is his G Unit clothing company <laughs> logo, which is kind of fascinating. But it says, I am what I am. And I guess it's saying, like, you know, he, he may be known as this performer, but he's really a criminal. You know, um, and then I, started, I kind of wondered, like I saw when I first saw it, it was a group of like multi mixed group of teenagers. And I was wondering how the people from different different ethnicities kind of related to each other in the group and how that affected what they thought about each other when they saw images like this. Because I do think advertising is a form of brainwashing that we see them more. We start to believe them as truth. And so I, I went online. I was like, maybe I'm just being too sensitive. I wanted to see kind of what other ads they were putting up at the time. And so um, one of the other ads was this one. There's Andy Roddick, and you know, then there's then there was one of Lucy Liu, and one of Yao Ming, and uh, then there was Allen Iverson, and Jay Z, and I and I, I saw something interesting when I saw it. So I saw it, like this one black man is a criminal, the one white man is a champion, although he is modest about it. <laughs> you know, the, the Asian American woman is kind of this innocent, docile little girl. And then you have the, the Chinese giant, something we clearly don't know what to do with. He's a, a monkey on a basketball. Um, then we have the other black guy is the, the devil. And then, you know, then Jay Z says, I got my MBA as, at Marcy Projects, from Marcy Projects, basically. So being a drug dealer, you know, and, and, I, and I thought that was really fascinating in a country where African American men are 5% of the population on a good day, you know, many of which whom are in jail, you know, that you, you have, they're represented three times in this first campaign that's selling Reebok products without having Reebok products in it. <laughs> and, you know, and one of them's a criminal, one of them's the devil, and one of them's a, a drug dealer, so also a criminal. And then one white male is a champion and like, so what kind of, what kind of, why, and then there's only one female in this case, and there was an Asian American person, woman who could like, she could be all, she could she cover a lot of bases at once, which is, and so I was really started to think about how critiquing advertising can really lead, tell us a lot about our culture and what our values are. And so I, and someone get, had given me this ad in 2001, and they were like, what, you know, you should do something with this. And it was right when I'd started kind of working with those other ads, and I was like, I, I don't know what to do with this. This is an ad for a t 2001 Toyota RAV4, and after like four years of looking at it, the only thing I could think of doing was this. <laughs> and I realized that the, after doing that, the last thing that you'd think this was an ad for was Japanese cars. And so because, you know, there's all of these ways in which, you know, there are myths and generalizations that can be attached to an idea through the, the text, and so I started to look at other ads and remove the, the advertising information and started realizing kind of, it could be an ad for anything, and it's only our conditioning that allows us to bring the meaning to it. And so this is a project called Unbranded Reflections in Black by Corporate America from 1968 to 2008. And in it, basically I wanted to track blackness as a commercial idea from the symbolic end of the civil rights movement when Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated and I just picked 2008 just because I was like, oh, it'll be 40 years, something will be interesting, it'll be happening. Just happened to be the year that we elected the first um, 
uh, you know, multi-ethnic president. Um, and that was really fascinating to, to be bookended by, you know, Martin Luther King's assassination of the election of Barack Obama, but tracking blackness through these, these images. And especially since most of the people who are making these images are white men on Madison Avenue in New York, kind of trying to figure out what black people value and then creating these images for black people to consume and then for sometimes white people to then see these images and say, okay, I want to be like black people and, 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 and replicate that. So I call it reflection of the black because like, is it, are they black, quote unquote, black values or are they white values or are they American values? Um, is what, and so this is an ad from 1969. What do you guys think this is an ad for? Pants, good one. Um, but, and it was, it said slack power the anti-establishment post-grad slacks by his. And it's ironic because it was basically as early as 1969, they were kind of figuring out how to appropriate the language and the feeling of the black power movement to sell what looked like golf pants to me to like the educated uh, revolutionary. Um, and then, uh, then what about this, this image? Sarah, do you recognize the person in the image? It's Joe Frazier. Heavy, heavyweight champion, and actually, it's not an ad, ad for syrup, it's for margarine. And he says, you think you can get me to eat my blue, my flapjacks without my blue bonnet, try it. And which is pretty fascinating when you think like the heavyweight boxing champion, one of the, the at that time, rare symbols of like African American power and prowess, you know, and the, our reference in it is this clear reference to a, 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 a mammy um, caric caricature. And I think that, and like, but it's it's kind of, thinly veiled and covered by this. And so with the project, I'm really interested in kind of undressing these things and looking at these other stories. I think that you can learn as much about a society by looking at their advertising then through reading perhaps a whole book at a period of time. So this is an ad, and also, rather than with the branded stuff where it's kind of my idea, like these, are, and these ads are a reflection of our hopes. All, we're all implicated in these images and because they represent our values and our ideas. And what do you think, this is an ad from 2005 that I found in Ebony Magazine. What do you guys think this is an ad for? Silence. <laughs> okay, it's 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 an ad for kitty litter. <laughs> and you might ask yourself how this ad found itself in Ebony Magazine, and I can only you know pontificate, but I imagine that there's someone in the boardroom and they were like, "How do we get black people to buy our kitty litter?" Well, black people like watermelon. And what would make watermelon more civilized if all the seeds were in one place and you could just scoop them away, just like our kitty litter? Like, that's the only real logic that makes this work. And it's similar to the gold tooth one. Like, black people like gold teeth, you know? What if we turned our car into a gold tooth? <laughs> and I actually have a friend who has that car, and I always make fun of her. Um, <laughs> um, but so, I mean, it, so, so, and so I started looking at these ads, and like this is one from, so there's, I took two ads for every year from 1968 to 2008, so it's 82 images. And there's really some that are signs of the time. So this is an ad from 1977 that's literally an ad that could not have existed 10 years before in 1967. Because to have a black man and a white man sitting at the lunch counter and uh, together, you know, but also having the white man looking longingly at the black man's dark meat which is kind of, I think, a subtle reference to you know Gordon Park's legacy with the Shaft and with the films that came after Black Power, uh, the black exploitation about this you know the super black macho uh, images that people had started to become really comfortable with uh, in the early 70s. You know, this is one from 1987, um, which is a cigarette ad, and, and it said it was for Salem cigarettes, and said the ref the refreshest up top. Cigarette ads are always about how refreshing they are, and uh, what I love about this is like basically the best way to smoke the cigarette is to sit in front of a fan so the smoke can just like rise up and just blow back into your face so you can get that full refreshing cigarette feeling. <laughs> um, but then th there's other images like this one from 1979 where I think are other signs at the time like where um, this is, I think these people just happen to be black, you know, where race isn't as much of a factor. I think you see gender roles fall into play so the men play as the women watch but there's something really revealing on the left side where this woman is being fed, feeding this guy this burger. You know, but then if you look at his right hand, he's got his own burger down there. So you can almost imagine the photographer saying, okay, you need something to do, feed him. You know, so as we progress, we also bring things with us, but we also forget some things, um, which was, and I had, so this is, 
at, as a photographer, I struggled with this idea of appropriation, using other people's images to make my art. Uh, but I realized there was no way to actually do the work without using real ads. Um, and even if I tried to copy the images, I still would be infringing on someone's copyright. Um, and I had, so I had two rules. I couldn't sell any pictures that I knew the name of the photographer, and I couldn't use any pictures that I wish I'd, take, I'd taken. And so I saw this picture from 2001. I was like, this is a really nice image. You know, it was for Black History Month. It said, once upon a time in America, there, uh, there were people who were proud, they were strong. And it was this like, it, I mean, you never guess, but it's a Chevy ad, clearly. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and, and like, I was like, wow, this is a really nice ad. And it's like basically this timeline. And so we have like the African chief Grio, and we have the Civil War um, soldier, and we have the jazz musician, and the civil rights activist, and then the college graduate. Um, I was looking at this is really nice. And I was like, wait a minute, somebody's missing in this timeline. And so I actually retitled all the images. And this one I retitled, Once Upon a Time in America, There Were No Slaves. Because you can't really sell the heartbeat of America with a picture of a beat up bloody slave you know, in the midst of it. And so in the corporate idea of black history, we came here just like everybody else. We had a rich tradition, and then we just fought for our rights. And then, you know, like, but you know, the main part of African American history, they like, no, nah, we can't touch that. And I, I assume they had African Americans kind of give this a pass, and I think that's so fascinating kind of how we can whitewash all of history <laughs> to, tell, to sell this product. And so this is how all, all these images were put up in this timeline and where I first showed it at the Rebel Collection in Miami. And then the last thing I wanted to show you before um, this one last piece was how there were all these images I started finding that were um, basically images that didn't fit into my rule for that product, so there were pictures of like non other people of color represented in similar ways that you would never see African Americans represented today. And so I started looking at kind of coon images from like the 30s and 40s and, and, and seeing kind of this amazing kind of resurgence in images of other brown people. And you never hear African Americans protesting about that. You know, so I call this one, now that's funny. You know, it's like now that's not me, I can really like appreciate you know, the humor in some of these images. Um, and some, well, this one I found like the most fascinating because it was like literally these, these two images were taken 70 years apart and you would be really hard for you to find an image today of a black person, especially a black American person in a field smiling, you know, doing manual labor because you know, there'd be a huge uproar. But in this image is for a fair trade tea leaf company and, and the fact that these images are taken 70 years apart, almost identical, and it's this idea that there's someone halfway around the world that's like happy to, to be under the hot sun with a basket strapped to her head, you know, picking leaves so that we could never, so she could have an extra dollar a day and not spend time with her family or educate her family or educate herself, you know, but we, it makes us feel good about ourselves for not having to do that work. And so there's something that was really, and my friend told me basically that in a sense, this, the text, it didn't grow by itself. That was from the image on the left. But he was saying that in a sense, we're the fertilizer because that the image on the left was for, it was for cotton fertilizer. It wasn't for, <laughs> and it's like saying like, forget me, it's really the fertilizer that makes the cotton, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, so yeah, and so in a way he said, we're like the fertilizer for these ideas, you know, that they kind of, they perpetuate through us. And I was able to show them, some of them in public. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about the, the piece, which I was so happy that the Ulrich Museum was actually the first museum um, and the only museum to, to buy the entire series. Uh, and the, but there is a, 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 an, um, a group of them at the Ford Foundation in New York. Um, and uh, basically, I was born in 1976, so eight years after this image was taken. And I found it fascinating that the, you know, it was necessary in this country just eight years before I was born for people to have to like affirm, collectively stand and affirm their humanity, especially because the phrase that I grew up with wasn't I am a man, it was I am the man, which really speaks to a lot of the kind of ways in which uh, there was movement during the, after integration and through the hip hop generation from this collective statement to this you know, really truly selfish statement about the me instead of the we. Um, but I really wanted to kind of think about how I could remix that and, and kind of flip the script. So I made um, this, this, uh, this series of paintings and kind of remixed them to the first, in this, in this order, the, the top row was um, almost like a timeline. I think 
I am three fifths of a man was, you know, when the Constitution was mit written, African Americans were counted as three fifths of a human being. You know, am I a man? I was thinking about the brochure says, am I not a man and a brother? I am a man. And then thinking about the Vietnam War and thinking about the uh, women's, uh, the women's movement, but also thinking about Sojourner Truth. But the last row I, I kind of read as a poem and it says, I'm the man, who's the man? You the man, what a man. I am man, I am human, I am many, I am, am I, I am, I am, I am a man. And what basically the ultimate resolution for me is that perhaps rather than validating or judging myself on, or, or ourselves on anyone else's standards, maybe our greatest gift is our consciousness because that's the only thing that we can control. Uh, and, and, and I think it's a really undervalued gift. And because we've seen people, as we've seen with Gordon Parks, overcome in, like, you know, in, in seemingly insurmountable and incredible odds to do but so much through the power of their mind, the choice of weapons. And um, that's what, and you know, think about Stephen Hawking and all these, you know, these people, this girl who serves with one arm, you know, like these things that we don't even realize that it's just the belief in the and in in in, them, in ourselves that gives us um, it, you know our greatest power. So thank you guys for your time and for sit, listening. So.